Hello everyone. Uh, today we're going to start off chapter 14 by uh, looking at a couple of uh, special type of uh, op amp uh, applications or op amp um, implementations. Uh, first one is the instrumentation amplifier. The next one's going to be the isolation amplifier. So those are the two we're going to talk about today. Um, now the instrumentation amplifier is for all intents and purposes an op amp, okay? It from the outside it looks like an op amp, and it war and it operates just like an op amp. Um, in other words, it's got it multiplies the uh, difference in voltage between the two input terminals and creates an output voltage. Uh, the difference between an instrumentation amp and a regular op amp is that it's sort of an op amp on steroids when it comes to common mode rejection ratio it does an exceptional job of rejecting noise and amplifying um, that differential voltage very cleanly. So uh, why would you use an, uh, uh, an instrumentation amp instead of a regular op amp to do that? Well, if you need, uh, if you have an application that requires that sort of uh, noise uh, uh, suppression, a common mode rejection ratio and so on like that. Also, there's just there's just one gain set resistor, which we'll see in a minute. You don't have to put two resistors on it, just one <clears throat> in order to get the, the gain you want. Um, where are these used? Well, they're used uh, for microphone amplifier, microphone preamps. Uh, they're used for instrumentation, uh, for long signal runs, uh, twisted pair and so on that is shielded uh, with a, a braid or foil shield uh, for a long run, uh, a long uh, distance of wire. So it, it does a very good job of suppressing that common mode noise. I wanted to mention something here on the lab uh, for this, uh, uh, for this um, instrumentation app, which we do. We normally in the class, um, what I do is I skip the last part, which has you excuse me, build a 555 timer and, and input some noise, uh, artificial or generated noise into the instrumentation amp inputs to study how it rejects that noise. We it actually, in the practical lab, we don't do that part, we do it a little differently. What we do is we hook up two clip leads, two leads, not clip leads, but like banana leads uh, to uh, the inputs, one to the uh, inverting input one to the non-inverting input. And what we do is we, we hold them apart from one another or we lay them across the equipment like the scopes and power supplies on the bench and we look at the output and see all the noise. All right, because that's not common mode noise. Those, that's noise. There's noise going into one lead that's very different than the noise going into the other lead because they're so far apart. The induced electromagnetic interference is in a different field when they're that far apart. Then while monitoring the scope, we bring the two leads together and then twist them together. And what happens is you'll see on the scope that noise comes way, way down. And the reason is, is because the field, the noise field that those two leads is now, are now experiencing are very similar because they're in the same physical location. And uh, it's a great, I think it's a great uh, demonstration of the CMRR, common mode rejection ratio um, behavior of, uh, of an instrumentation amplifier. Uh, so obviously in multi-SIM for, for what we're doing now, you can't do that either. So um, you may just want to, in your lab report, comment on that, um, on how, how to do that. You might be able to gin something up in, um, in multi-SIM, for example, tie the two inputs together and inject a signal uh, from a signal source and, and see that the output's not doing anything. But we sort of already did that in the prior lab with just a regular op-amp, but it does reinforce it. Um, okay, so like it says here, it, it amplifies uh, um, the voltage between the two input terminals and um, that might be riding on uh, large common mode signals is what an instrumentation amplifier would do. It does, and the, the 
um, gain is set by RG, this, this gain resistor right here. It's just, it's just one, uh, one resistor, and there's a, there's a nice little formula for it, which we'll see, I guess, on the next slide. Um, so here's the formula. Gain set resistor is, uh, in this case, with this particular AD622, that's an actual part, um, it's 50.5K divided by AD minus 1. So a little example here, what value of RG will set the gain to 35? Just put 35 in there, you end up with 1.5K. So you get a gain of 35. And just like any op amp, uh, the bandwidth is reduced as you um, increase the gain. So uh, with a gain of one um, for the 8622 part, you get a, a bandwidth that's um, approaching a megahertz. You know, it's probably one, two, three, maybe, well, 400 kilohertz or 500 kilohertz, somewhere through there. So as you, as you uh, increase uh, the gain, a uh, gain of 10, we're now looking more like uh, 200 kilohertz or so, right? And as you increase the gain to 100, we're looking at more like um, less than 100 kilohertz. And then for a gain of 1,000, which is perhaps a, a microphone application, uh, now your, your bandwidth has been reduced to a pretty low, a couple, couple kilohertz. So this may not be suitable for um, a microphone amplifier, preamplifier. You might need something with a little bigger bandwidth. And just like regular op amps, instrumentation amps, there's thousands of them. There's not just the 8622, there's thousands of these things. Um, where I've used them in my work are indeed microphone amplifiers um, and there's specialized instrumentation amps for, that are used for microphone amplifiers. So you don't just use any uh, particular one. And that's, that's um, pretty typical uh, of, of manufacturers will uh, design and produce uh, an operational amplifier, instrumentation amplifier, any part for that matter, that is designed for a specific purpose. But this instrumentation amps are very, very, have very narrow applications that are not, not that they can be used for, for different things, but usually a manufacturer like analog devices or, or Texas Instruments or um, Linear Tech or anybody like that will design an instrumentation app for a particular purpose or f f target it at an application. Okay. Okay, so the band, bandwidth for gain of 35, so 35, 20, 35 is going to be, let's see, 20, 35 is going to be right here. So it's going to be somewhere in there. Let's see if they get it to us here. Yeah, about there, about a couple hundred kilohertz. Okay, I think this is interesting how some instrumentation amps uh, provide what is called a data guard output or a guarding output. And the way that cables work, okay, uh, this, this particular cable here is, is a model or a, a example of a twisted pair shielded uh, cable. And again, why do they twist, twist the cable, twist the wires? Because any electromagnetic interference, any field, they're hitting, that field is hitting both wires about the same when they're close together and twisted like that. And so you'll see a lot of examples of that, not only what I was talking about microphone cables, but ethernet cables, you know, your ethernet, uh, uh, you know, the, the blue, uh, uh, are, you know, ethernet wires are four pairs or more of twisted, each one of each pair is twisted because those are differential signals it actually goes into a transformer. Okay, on either end, inner network interface or the switch or whatever it is. Uh, so those are balanced signals. Um, sometimes uh, 
those cables are shielded also. And what's interesting is in order to keep the speed up, uh, understand a shield is a, is a, uh, uh, some wire braid or foil around that pair or sometimes a single wire, uh, in which case it would be a co called a coax. You're familiar with that probably. This is an example of a twin axe where it's two twisted pair of wires with a shield. But what's interesting is that shield actually with the wires forms a capacitor. All right, any two pieces of conduct conductive metal next to each other <clears throat> will form a capacitor. And as it shows here, it's a distributed capacitance. And what two capacitors do uh, when they're connected to ground in parallel with your signal path? Well, they short out high frequencies, right? That's what capacitors, that's their job. So wouldn't it be great if we can somehow cancel that <clears throat> or reduce that capacitance? Well, we can't remove the shield because that allows the noise to get in. So what we can do is render the capacitor useless by removing the voltage potential on it. You know, a, volt, a capacitor with no voltage potential on it really isn't really much of a capacitor. And that's what the data guard does. It actually takes the common mode voltage of the two inputs and puts it through a voltage follower and drives the data guard out or drives the shield with, a, with what's called a data guard output at that voltage. So the shield is sitting at about the same voltage as each one of those wires, which basically removes the capacitor or the distributed capacitance. Um, yeah, so transducer interface, certain microfilm preamps. Um, transducer interface, what, what is that? Transducers, well, pressure transducers, uh, temperature transducers, anything that's far away uh, from uh, the sending unit is far away from the receiving unit, relatively, or in a high noise environment, such as an automobile. Um, you'll see this, okay? You'll see this sort of uh, instrumentation app being used. The AD522 is a low noise instrumentation amp that has a data guard output. So it's connected to the shield. And you can program the gain from one to a thousand. And the frequency response rolls off at minus 20 dB per decade, which is just single pole roll off. So as you see, it's got this data guard output on pin 13, which drives the shield of your, co of your twin axe in this case, okay? And there's a little frequency response plot. You can go to digikey.com and type in instrumentation amplifier, and it'll come up with some choices for you. AD, it's an analog devices part. Analog devices was, uh, I think, uh, absorbed by Texas Instruments, maybe. Um, Texas Instruments is sort of like... Uh, the Death Star, they've, they've absorbed so many different companies. Um, I know analog devices and linear technology are, are together now. Linear technology is a very good company. They make amplifiers and great power supply integrated circuits, power supply chips, uh, voltage regulators. Um, Analog devices is has been problematic in the past for me because they, I'll design something in and they'll cancel the part. They'll discontinue it. So I'm not a big fan of analog devices. And when they merged analog devices and linear tech, I was really bummed out because here's one company I really like getting together with one company I really don't like. I hope the good stuff rubs off on the, the, the analog devices company. Uh, so far, I don't really know. I still use a lot of linear tech stuff, though. It's a very good linear technology, very good company. If you're, I don't, I don't own stock in it, I promise. But um, if you want to do some some good power supply design, they've got some good stuff. Okay, the other kind of amplifier I wanted to talk about today is something called an isolation amplifier. Now, it's an electrical barrier between the input and output to to uh, to provide uh, what's called galvanic isolation, basically. Uh, there's no way 
that any big electricity is going to get from one side to the other. Right? So if I'm sitting in, and laying in a bed in a hospital somewhere and I've got an EKG hooked up to me um, and it's in Florida and there's a lightning storm in the middle of uh, July here, I don't want that lightning to come through <laughs> that instrument and, and into my sensors that are connected up to my body. So that's what isolation amplifiers are for. Okay, that's, that's a big reason why they exist. The other reason they exist is for non-health safety reasons. It has more to do with um, large uh, building and uh, systems and distributed uh, input output uh, sensors and things like that in a building where perhaps one side of the building has a different ground potential than than the other side of the building and you're sending the wires back and forth. If they're isolated, you don't have to worry about what ground is at what. It's very difficult in a building, well, it, it's challenging. There's special ways of doing it to keep in a, a large uh, uh, square footage building such as a warehouse or a, a theme park attraction or um, some large data center, keep all the equipment racks at the same ground. Uh, yeah, there's the big green wires and so on like that that hook everything up, but that doesn't always work, especially when lightning hits one side of the building and lifts up the ground there and leaves the other one, other side uh, where it was. And that, that causes uh, equipment to get blown up and, and damaged and so on. So <clears throat> isolation amplifiers can really help with that. So how do they work? <clears throat> Basically, what happens is there's an input stage and an output stage. And the input stage takes the signal, all right? And whatever that signal is, it turns it into an AC signal that represents the level of that input, all right? So it could be a pulse width modulation or it could be a frequency, whatever. It is a representation of that input. So if it's an FM type modulator, uh, maybe a higher voltage results in a higher frequency and a lower voltage results in a lower frequency. Or it could be pulse width modulation where a higher, free, higher voltage on the input results in a, a wider pulse and a, uh, a lower voltage on the input uh, here uh, results in a, a narrower pulse and so on. So uh, that whatever it is, that modulator um, presents that to a antenna, if you will. In this case, this is a capacitor coupling. Uh, and a capacitor is really like a little uh, transmitting and receiving station, right? You've got the transmitting plate and you've got the receiving plate. And the, the uh, charge is going from one to the other. So right here, this capacitor uh, has a transmitting plate here on the on the input stage and the receiving plate here. So this capacitor acts as a little transmitter receiver pair. And then the output of the uh, output, if you will, of the capacitor or the receiver goes into a demodulator to another op amp and voila, you have your original signal back. Now the capacitor here has a very high uh, dielectric constant or a high dielectric breakdown meaning that um, if a voltage is present on this side, high, it won't, it will not be able to get through here unless it's a really, really high voltage. And most isolation amplifiers are rated um, in 15,000 volts or so. There's different ones, but a very common number for galvanic isolation is 15,000 volts. So that's pretty good. Now, a 15,000 volt capacitor is a very big capacitor. Um, so it's, it's kind of, it's a capacitor, but it's a special kind of capacitor. It's a capacitive coupling mechanism. All right. And less important is the capacitance, but more important is the voltage, um, put, uh, potential, the, the maximum voltage potential that's allowed. Now there's other types, let's see what else this says. Your typical yeah, uses high frequency modulated carrier to pass a lower frequency signal through the barrier. So again, this modulator could be an uh, FM or um, 
probably an FM type modulator, not an AM, um, or a pulse width modulation is very, very common. More common, I would say, than FM frequency modulation. Uh, we have the IO one, ISO 124, and again, you can go on DigiKey and, and type in isolation amplifiers, and you'll see uh, how many there are. Capacity coupled isolation that, that uses pulse width modulation to transmit data across the barrier. Okay, so again, here's a PWM type thing. These capacitors, if, if you're wondering, these are um, used for uh, decoupling, uh, power supply decoupling. Notice that the isolation amplifier has two sets of power supplies. We have the input stage power supply and we have the output stage power supply. Now this plus 15 volts is not the same plus 15 volts as this is. It's a different plus 15 volts. Matter of fact, they probably should have labeled it differently. This plus and minus 15 volts, they come from a different power supply that's associated with the input stage. And the output stage, plus and minus 15 volt, that comes from a different power supply that's powered from something different than what the input is powered from. So that's the tricky part. You may actually also have to have an isolated power supply, which you can do. Uh, so it says here it's a fixed unity gain with uh, 1,500 volts of isolation. Um, 50 kilohertz high frequency ripple through the pulse width modulation may be observed on the output at higher frequencies. So there's a little distortion possibly. This would be very easy to get rid of using some uh, uh, low pass filtering. This little jagginess here on the output. And certainly on the output signal, you can put um, some op amp filters and things like that. We're going to look at op amp filters at the end of this course. So you will design a really nice, uh, isolated, clean system when we're all done here. There's another one that they, that they present here, the 3656KG. And instead of using a capacitor coupling, we use transformer coupled isolation. So right in here is a transformer. Uh, you know, a transformer, there is no real connection between the input and output other than the magnetic field between the coils, so that serves the purpose of the galvanic isolation. Um, it works the same way. You can use FM or pulse width modulation on the input uh, modulation and then demod demodulate that. There's one other kind of uh, isolation amplifier method. Uh, we've looked at capacitive coupling. We've looked at transformer coupling. There's also optical coupling where in this uh, coupling region, there's a LED that if you basically flashes on and off with the modulation. And then there is a opto coupler. It's an opto coupler. There's, an, <clears throat> there's a, a light receiver here, uh, basically a photo <clears throat> receptor, photo transistor on the output that receives that light and uh, demodulates the, the voltage coming out of it. <clears throat> That's very common and it's very inexpensive and, and um, um, works really well from a, from a galvanic isolation standpoint. Okay. So here's a little bit more information on the 3656. It can have gain on the input or output, so it might save you an extra stage. Um, <clears throat> this shows this gain feedback uh, uh, stage here and, and these two resistors here, which I guess are the output um, gain. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So for an ECG amplifier, uh, patient monitoring, electrocardiogram, uh, that's, I guess these are used for that. I think... That's it for today. Next week, we'll do operational transconductance amplifiers and uh, finish up chapter 14. Okay, we'll see you next. If you have any questions, please post it to the discussion area. Thank you.